want to thank everyone for coming here tonight. It's, it really feels good to be in a room full of people. Thank you very much for coming here. I appreciate it. <laughs> <coughs> Well, Ann Richards asked me one time if I had any deep-seated fears that had been with me my whole life that I couldn't shake. And I thought for a while, and I realized that, yeah, I was born in 1931, which was like very early in the, in the uh, Great Depression. And the sight of bread lines and of soup kitchens and of people coming up to our door in Fort Worth, knocking on the door and begging for food, all those things, were like stamped into my circuits when I was very young. And so I told Ann, I said, yeah, I, one of the deep-seated fears I've always had is the fear of being destitute. Broke, I've been a lot, but destitute, not. And so I was afraid of that. And the other deep-seated fear I've always had, I told Ann, was making a fool out of myself. And Ann laughed and she said, well, you sure picked out a hell of a way to make a living. She <laughs> said, he said, because it's really hard to make any money writing, but making a fool out of yourself is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> At TCU, uh, I uh, was already, by the time I got to in the TCU, I was already working full time at the Fort Worth Press and uh, writing stories that appeared in the paper every day. Without, if a day went by without my byline in the paper, I thought it was a wasted day. And uh, I... Uh, wanted to write a novel, though. That's, that's the thing I really want. I really uh, set this goal for myself to write a novel by the time I was 28, because that's what Hemingway did, and that's what Fitzgerald did. And uh, <coughs> I uh, took, I was l very lucky at TCU that I had two of those great professors, the kind of teachers that stay with you your whole life, that you, that you never forget their influence. One was, a, one was uh, Dr. Lorraine Shirley, who taught interrelation of the arts, how all these things fit together. And the other was a fellow, a very elegant man named Dr. Paul Dinkins. And Dr. Dinkins taught the great novels, the great European novels. And we spent about a year and a half, I, I did in, in, in Dinkins' class, where Dinkins would sit on the edge of the desk and cross his legs and talk for an hour, and it, 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 would, be, it, would, be, it would be fascinating. We spent uh, like a year and a half on three books on the Brothers Karamazov, which is the greatest murder mystery ever written, on War and Peace, which is the greatest historical novel ever written, and on a, a novel called The Magic Mountain, which is an investigation of the European soul as it uh, leads up to World War II. And after, after going through these books, like for a year and a half, I came out of there and I thought, well, you know, I want to write a novel, but why bother? You know, these, these guys have already done it. These are the great novels. And when I say great, I throw, I'm as careless as everybody else with using the word great. You know, it was a great cheeseburger. It was a great baseball game last night. It was a great movie I saw last week. But uh, when I talk about novels, when I say great, I, I, I'm very careful. Uh, and I, I apply great, like, to those three novels I was talking about. And I thought that, you know, at the time, after, after studying these three novels, I thought, well, this, this is sort of like taking a, uh, a young art student and taking him into the Sistine Chapel and saying, you want to be a painter? Just do it like this guy did it. You'll be all right. You know? And, and uh, then, as I was wondering, you know, I was kept on writing all these stories, of course, in the paper, and then Ernest Hemingway came to my rescue. The first two sentences of Sun Also Rises are, Robert Cohn was once middleweight boxing champion at Princeton. Do not think I am much impressed by that as a title, but it meant a great deal to Cohn. <laughs> and I thought, that sounds like what I wrote in the press yesterday. It sounds exactly like one of my columns. I can write like that. And that was the great thing about Hemingway, because he made you feel like you could write as well as he did. And I, so I, I got to where I thought, of, you can't, I couldn't, man, I can't write as well as Hemingway, I'm not claiming that. But he made you want to try, made me want to try. And uh, he, uh, uh, <coughs> Fitzgerald came along about the same time. Uh, and I really appreciated Fitzgerald's youthful exuberance and the way he, he kind of overwrote everything. And then he read Hemingway and he learned how to write. And, and he. Uh, wrote what is probably the great American novel, which is The Great Gatsby. 
And so I, uh, I went back and, and tried to uh, write myself uh, in my own voice. And I, I thought of Hemingway, I would say, at that, that time as like the Perry Como of writers, because who among us of a certain age <clears throat> has not had two or three drinks and then sang, uh, thought, thought, well, I could sing as well as Perry Como, you know, let, <laughs> let me have a shot at Prisoner of Love and, and stand back. You know. uh, another person who had, another writer who had the same, at the same time as Hemingway and Fitzgerald, it was maybe a little later, Gary Cartwright and I were sitting at our, at our desk one day in the Dallas Times Herald, and, and here came walking through the thing came uh, Billy Lee Bramer and his wife Nadine. And Billy Lee had just published a novel called uh, The Gay Place. And he had won the Houghton Mifflin Prize, which was a very big deal, very impressive. And the thing that got me, though, is I thought, well, and, and we all went, we went on with Billy Lee over to the press club that afternoon and had, had a bunch of drinks and talked. And the thing about it was that <clears throat> Billy Lee was writing about people that I knew, and he was writing about things at the Schultz Garden, and he was writing about politics. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that novel, so you know what it's about. But, I mean, I had, when Billy Lee walked through the press room, that walked through the newspaper that day, I had already written one novel. It was, it was, a, it was, it was a Western, and I thought, well, nobody probably in New York is going to be interested in my life or the people I know or what I'm doing. I have to write a Western. But I learned that from reading Billy Lee Bramer that that's not true, that people took Billy Lee seriously. And when you could write about the Schultz Garden and, and New York, people in New York do, did take it seriously. Fiction writing is a difficult thing to talk about because it uh, all comes from the human consciousness and <clears throat> philosophy nor science, neither one, have ever decided what human consciousness is or whether it even exists. And yet, we know that as fiction writers, human consciousness is where you have your office. You know, that's where you go to work. And so I, I try, I really don't talk about fiction writing very much, but because I have one thing I don't know much about it, I, I just, I do it by the seat of my pants. And I hear voices and, and, uh, and I follow these, these, guide, these guidelines. But there's two things that I have learned that I can, I can tell anybody who wants to be a writer. Uh, in 50 some odd years of writing stories, I've, I've learned two things. One is that action is character, and two is always use active verbs. <laughs> and beyond that, you're on your own. <laughs> I can, however, tell you the secret to a happy life. Uh, I got it from a fellow named Boudini Brown who was, Boudini was uh, Muhammad Ali's companion, corner man, psychic coach. I think in the early days, when, in the 60s, when, when uh, Ali was getting ready to fight Sonny Liston, who everybody uh, was afraid of. I'll tell this one brief story about Sonny Liston. <clears throat> I was interviewing Sonny Liston in 1962 in a hotel in Chicago before he fought Floyd Patterson. And all the experts were saying that, that uh, Floyd Patterson, Floyd Patterson was the champion at that time. Sonny Liston, they called him the bear. He was a really ominous, sullen-looking guy who, who was the kind of guy that you didn't want to get too close to, even in any kind of polite situation. And uh, so I was telling uh, uh, Liston how all the experts had said that Liston was too slow to catch Floyd Patterson, who was very fast. And they said, Liston will never catch up with him. Patterson will just cut him to pieces. And while I was telling Liston all this, we were in a hotel room in, the, in Chicago, no air conditioning, the windows were open, flies in the room and everything. And while we were talking, Liston kind of did like this. And uh, when I got through with what I had to say, he, he stared at me with this baleful gaze. And then he opened his fist like this. And there was a house fly in there. And he said, is this fast enough to catch the skinny little son of a bitch? <laughs> so. I knew then that this fight was over. Uh, it lasted one round, and then Liston fought him again and knocked him out in the first round again. But meanwhile, uh, uh, Boudini Brown, who was a tall black guy with, with a white stripe down his head, and he'd been, he traveled the world, and he called, he was a Jewish convert. He'd searched for knowledge all over the world, and uh, he called himself the Black Moses. He, uh, uh, and he was the guy who came up with float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The eyes can't, the hands can't hit what the eyes can't see. And that became Muhammad Ali's mantra for the rest of his life. 
and that was certainly the psychological uh, psychological tool that helped him get in the ring with Liston, and it, and it really really screwed Liston up uh, uh, psychologically. But anyway, so so Boudini Brown and I were sitting in a bar one day talking, and it was the it was about 1967, and the world's in turmoil, and, and the, there were riots going on all over the country, the kind of riots that we would be having today if we had a had a draft, and. Uh, <clears throat> We were talking about happiness, and, and, and uh, Boudini said, he said, you know, I have walked across Africa. I have climbed the mountains in India. I have consulted with the wizards in the jungles of Brazil, and I found the secret of happiness. And I said, really, where, what? And he said, I found it in a song by Johnny Mercer and Harold Arlen, and it goes like this. You have to accentuate the positive, <laughs> eliminate the negative, latch onto the affirmative, and don't mess with Mr. In Between. <laughs> Thank you.